top of the day. Beautiful people, top of the day. There we go. All right. I am live. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. Y'all, today is November 28, 2021, day 313 of year three. Of reading through the books of the Law and the Prophets and of the three year consecutive day count, day 981. Y'all, today we're reading Psalm 134 through 136. Then we're going to pick up in Shakespeare's Secret Messiah and we're going to start chapter 13. On page 3, what? 76. 75, 375. Alright, y'all. So let's go ahead and do the Shema and get started real quick. Let's see. Remember, the Shema can be found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Remember, we started reading the whole full chapter so we can hear everything in its full context. All right, y'all. Navar, blessings, blessings. A call for wholehearted commitment. These are the commands, decrees, and regulations that Yahuwah, your God, commanded me to teach you. You must obey them in the land where you are about to enter and occupy. And you and your children and grandchildren must fear you who your God as long as you live. If you obey all his decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Listen closely, Israel, and be careful to obey. Then all will go well with you, and you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as Yahuwah, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Listen, O Israel, Yahuwah, our God, he is one God, and you must love you who are your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Yahuwah, your God, will soon bring you into the land that he swore to give to you when he made a vow to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is a land with large, prosperous cities that you did not build. The houses will be richly stocked with goods that you did not produce. You will draw water from cisterns you did not dig. And you will eat from vineyards and olive trees you did not plant. When you have eaten your field in this land, be careful not to forget Yahuwah, who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. You must fear Yahuwah your God and serve him. When you take an oath, you must use only his name. You must not worship any of the gods of the neighboring nations. For Yahuwah your God, who lives among you, is a jealous God. His anger will flare up against you, and he will wipe you from the face of the earth. You must not test your who or your God as you did when you complained at Massa. You must diligently obey the commands of your who or your God, all the laws and decrees he has given to you. Do what is right and good in your who is sight, so all will go well with you. Then you will enter and occupy the good land that your who will swore to give to your ancestors. You will drive out all the enemies living in the land, just as your who will said you would. In the future, your children will ask you, what is the meaning of these laws, decrees, and regulations that Yahuwah our God has commanded us to obey? Then you must tell them, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, but Yahuwah brought us out of Egypt with his strong hand. 
Yahuwah did miraculous signs and wonders before our eyes, dealing terrifying blows against Egypt and Pharaoh and all his people. He brought us out of Egypt so he could give us this land he had sworn to give to our ancestors. And Yahuwah our God commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear him so that he can continue to bless us and preserve our lives as he has done to this day. For we will be counted as righteous when we obey all the commands Yahuwah our God has given us. And that is the full context of the Shema. Shayla Hager, hey, Yahuwah is one. Yes, and amen. All right, y'all. Psalm 134. Check this apple. Okay, let me make sure they ain't gonna slide off of there. Psalm 134. It's three verses. A song for pilgrims ascending to Jerusalem. Oh, praise Yahuwah, all you servants of Yahuwah, who serve at night in the house of Yah. Lift your hands toward the sanctuary and praise Yahuwah. May Yahuwah, who made heaven and earth, bless you from, the, from Jerusalem. Next chapter, Psalm 135. Praise Yahuwah. Praise the name of Yahuwah. Praise him who serve Yahuwah, who serve in the house of Yahuwah, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise Yahuwah, for he is good. Celebrate his lovely name with music, for Yahuwah has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his own special treasure. I know that the greatness of Yahuwah, our God, is greater than any other God. Yahuwah does whatever pleases him throughout all heaven and earth and on the seas and in their depths. He causes the clouds to rise over the whole earth. He sends the lightning with the rain and releases the wind from his storehouses. He destroyed the firstborn of Egypt. He destroyed the firstborn in each Egyptian home, both people and animals. He performed miraculous signs and wonders in Egypt against Pharaoh and all his people. He struck down great nations and slaughtered mighty kings, Sihon, king of the Amorites, Og, king of Bashan, and all the kings of Canaan. He gave their land as an inheritance, a special possession to his people Israel. Your name, O Yahuwah, endures forever. Your fame, O Yahuwah, is known to every generation. For Yahuwah will give justice to his people and have compassion on his servants. The idols of nations are merely things of silver and gold shaped by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak and eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear and mouths but cannot breathe. And those who make idols are just like them as all who are trusting them. O Israel, praise Yahuwah. O priests, descendants of Aaron, praise Yahuwah. O Levites, praise Yahuwah. All you who fear Yahuwah, praise him. Yahuwah, be praised from Zion, for he lives here in Jerusalem. Praise Yahuwah. Last song for the day, Psalm 136. Give thanks to Yahuwah, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who alone does mighty miracles. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who made the heavens so skillfully. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who placed the earth among the waters. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who made the heavenly lights. His faithful love endures forever. The sun to rule the day. His faithful love endures forever. And the moon and the stars to rule the night. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who killed the firstborn of Egypt. His faithful love endures forever. He brought Israel out of Egypt. His faithful love endures forever. He acted with a strong hand and a powerful arm. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who parted the Red Sea. His faithful love endures forever. He led Israel safely through. His faithful love endures forever. But he hurled Pharaoh and his army into the sea. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who led his people through the wilderness. His faithful love 
endures forever. Give thanks to him who struck down mighty kings. His faithful love endures forever. He killed powerful kings. His faithful love endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, his faithful love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan, his faithful love endures forever. Yahuwah gave the land of these kings as an inheritance. His faithful love endures forever. A special possession to his servant Israel. His faithful love endures forever. He remembered us in our weakness. His faithful love endures forever. He saved us from our enemies. His faithful love endures forever. He gives food to every living thing. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His faithful love endures forever. That, my beautiful people, is our reading for today. I love that chapter. I love a whole lot of chapters, right? <laughs> All right, y'all. So here we go, chapter 13. It's entitled, The Ass-Headed Christ. I didn't name it that, right? All right. Page 375. It is well known the early Christians were often accused of worshiping an ass. Tacitus, Minicius, Felix, and Tertullian all recorded this fact. And it gives the references. TAC first, was it Tax 1, Volume 3, 4. Then there's a semicolon and it says Tert ad nationes. 114 semicolon meniscus comma octavius ix yeah that's what the reference is <laughs> for example tertullian claimed that an apostate jew one day i probably really should I, I read so much i probably really should read learn how to properly read the references forgive me i'm gonna get it together y'all for example Tertullian claimed that an apostate Jew one day appeared in the streets of Carthage carrying a figure robed in a toga with ears and hoofs of an ass and that this monstrosity was labeled Deus Christian, Christian, Christian Orum or no soul tease. Yeah, I know I screwed that up. Sorry. I'm going to spell it. Y'all write it down if you can. Deuce. D-E-U-S. The next word is the Christian norum. Christian. O-R-U-M. The last word. Ono cotes. Um, yeah. O-N-O-C-O-E-T-E-S. I think that's Latin. But it means the God of the Christians begotten of an ass. That might be the title today. That's kind of harsh. It ain't no harsher than the ass-headed Christ. Other representations of the ass-headed Christ have been discovered, including a terracotta fragment found in 1881 near Naples, which has been dated to the first century and shows a figure with the head of an ass wearing a toga and seated on a chair with a roll in his hand instructing a number of baboon-headed pupils. There, also, there is also an ancient gem with the carving of an ass-headed teacher of two human pupils who was dressed in the pileum, the, yeah, the pileum, the form of cloak peculiar to sacred personages in early Christian art. Another ancient Syrian terracotta fragment also represents Jesus, book in hand, with the ears of an ass. What lies in the back of this ass-headed imagery is a deeply hidden level of typological symbolism in the Gospels that indicates that the Jewish Christ was an ass that had been beheaded. I did not include it in the first edition of Caesar's Messiah as it is so complex and obscene that I felt it would make the it would make the simpler Jesus Titus typology, which is grim enough, more difficult to accept. 
recognizing the gospel's symbolism concerning the as begins with understanding the typological meaning of the phrase there they made him a supper and this can be that can be found in John chapter 12 verse 2 in brief the typological meaning of the phrase is established by its linkage to Josephus' description of a human Passover lamb that was a son of Mary. You can find that in Josephus' Jewish Wars, volume 6, uh, pages 201 through 219. Both Josephus and the gospel stories of the human Passover lamb contain the concepts of Lazarus, Mary, eating in a fine portion that was not taken away. This linkage builds upon the foundation established by the positioning of the human Passover lambs relative to the overall sequential typological mapping that exists between Jesus's ministry and Titus's campaign. Further, as I sh- further, as I also show in Caesar's Messiah, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he did not restore Lazarus to life, but merely raised his decomposing body from the ground. These facts enable the typological meaning of the gospel story that next describes Eliezer after he is raised from the dead. The anointing party where Jesus and his followers are described as reclining and preparing supper and anointing to become clear. When the author uses the pronoun he is to define whose head is covered with perfume, is it not hold on, let me read that again. When the author uses the pronoun his to define whose head is covered with perfume. So word is missing. I'm going to read it just like it said. Listen. When the author uses the pronoun his to define whose head is covered with perfume, is it not necessarily Jesus's? Maybe a word needs to be taken out. When the author uses the pronoun his to define whose head is covered with perfume, it is not necessarily Jesus. Maybe they'll switch it around with perfume. It is not necessarily Jesus. In fact, the passage links back, logically enough, to the gospel's last mention of a scent, the smell emanating from Lazarus, Lazarus's corpse. And the author uses the ambivalence inherent in pronouns to mask his real meaning. Thus, it is the head of Lazarus that is covered with perfume in Mark chapter 14, verse 3. It was done to mask its odor. This is also why his feet were perfumed in the version of the story given in John chapter 12, verses 1 through 9, and why the feet were saved for the day of the burial. The dark humor behind this mentioning of Lazarus's body parts is that to make a metal of any large animal. I'm sorry. Let me read that again. I said the wrong word. The dark humor behind this mentioning of Lazarus's body parts is that to make a meal of any large animal, it must first be butchered. And this is the activity that occurred during the anointing party where they made him a supper. The supper being prepared was the last supper in the Gospels, which would eat the bread of Eleazar's body. Following this logic, in Mark chapter 14, verse 5, after the anointing of a head, Judas complains that it could have been sold for more than 300 denarii. In the typological level of the story, he is not referring to the perfume, but to the head of Lazarus. The basis for the price he is asking is found in Second Kings chapter 6, verse 25, where the price of an ass's head is said to be 80 shekels. As a shekel was worth four denarii, the head would have the head would have fetched was three hundred and twenty denarii had it been sold. What? As a shekel was worth four denarii, the head would have fetched was three hundred and twenty denarii had it been sold.
I think a word is missing. <laughs> Levon said, watch your mouth. <laughs> Listen, okay, let me read this again. I think either a word is missing. Um, a myth is missing. As a shekel was worth four denarii, the head, if it would have been fetched, was 320 denarii had it been sold. Yeah, I think if is missing from that sentence. I won't go into the typological linkage between Josephus's cannibal Mary and 2 Kings chapter 6, 25 at this point, but only note that it should be obvious to anyone who has read Caesar's Messiah as the story is about a mother who cannibalizes her son during the siege of Jerusalem. The use of the word denarii also builds on the ass imagery in that the word den arius literally means 10 asses. I show the linkage between the 300 denarii in the Gospels and Titus's campaign below. The theme describing Lazarus's body parts continues in John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. As following the anointing party, Jesus is said to have previously found, the past tense, a young ass to sit upon. Notice that in John chapter 12, verse 1, Lazarus is said to be reclining the only way the dead can posture. Hence, he was easy to be sat upon. I must note that there is an unfortunate sexual innuendo behind the image as the Romans sought to humiliate the Jewish Christ in the most extreme and to them comic manner possible. The Gospels author narration immediately following Lazarus's butchering and being sat upon by Jesus is a masterpiece of sarcasm and double meaning. How disgusting is that? <laughs> like I just got it. What he was just saying. Ugh. The Gospel author's narration immediately following Lazarus's butchering and being sat upon by Jesus is a masterpiece of sarcasm and double meaning. At first, his disciples did not understand all of this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and they had done these things to him. John chapter 12 verse 16. The meaning of John chapter 12 16 is that only after Titus has been recognized as the Jesus of John 21, the Jesus that lived forever and whose followers fish for men will the things that had been written about him and done to him, that is, in this story to Lazarus, be comprehended. That was a long sentence. I'm going to read it again. Pay attention. The meaning of John chapter 12 verse 16 is that only after Titus has been recognized as the Jesus of John 21, the Jesus that lived forever and whose followers fished for men, will the things that had been written about him and done to him, that is, in this story to Lazarus, be comprehended. Notice how the passage becomes coherent with the shift in context. Moving through the typology, the anointing party described in the Gospels obviously foresees the anointing party described by Josephus which is easily determined by both the parallel context, the events are, I'm sorry, the events are perhaps the only two anointing parties in literature and the relative positioning of the parallel events in the ministries of Jesus and Titus. Quote, John emptied the temple's vessels of the sacred wine and oil and distributed it amongst the multitude who used them in drinking and anointing themselves, end quote. That's in Josephus's Wars, volume 5, chapter 13, page 565. However, the typological relationship between the Gospels and the next event of Josephus describes concerning a son of Lazarus and the hauling of bodies through Jerusalem's gates is much more difficult to determine and can only be understood once the typological meaning of the stories of Jesus' triumphal entrance on an ass in the synoptics is understood. I'm going to read that again. However, 
The typological relationship between the Gospels and the next event Josephus describes concerning a son of Lazarus and the hauling of bodies through Jerusalem's gates is much more difficult to determine and can only be understood once the typological meaning of the stories of Jesus's triumphal entrance on an ass and the synoptics is understood. A reader must first recognize that the stories in Matthew, Mark, and Luke occur following the triumphal entrance in John, which took place four days before the Passover. This is necessary because... As shown below, it establishes Lazarus as an ass that has been sat on before, and therefore distant from the asses Jesus asked to be brought to him in Mark and Luke, which he stipulates cannot have previously been sat on. I hope y'all picked that up. Sat on, when I say sat on, that's, that's the sexual, the hidden sexual innuendo, right? Y'all have an imagination. <laughs> what the author is actually doing is providing just enough details to make it logically clear that four asses were brought to Jesus, Lazarus and the donkey that are described in Matthew and the two cults described in Mark and Luke. The imagery that the author is working to create is a spoof of the prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 9, which if read literally seems to indicate that the king of the, that the king of the Jews rolled three asses simultaneously quote see your king comes to you righteous and having salvation gentle and riding on a donkey on a colt the fowl of a donkey end quote that's Zechariah 9 and 9 to digress it should be noted that the literary technique the author is using, hold on. Let me look at something real quick. Hold on. Wait a minute, y'all. I think there was a typo. I want to make sure that's right. Let me look up because he said Jeremiah 9 and 9, but then he gave the... um. The reference for Zechariah 9 and 9. Let me just look up both of them real quick. I just want to make sure that's right. Nine. Yeah, I think that was a typo. Okay, because let me make sure that's right. Let me make sure I typed it in right. Jeremiah 9, verse 9 says, Should I not punish them for this, says who Should I not avenge myself against such a nation? Okay, let's go to Zechariah. Let's spell Zechariah wrong. Hold on. Okay, Zechariah 9 9 says. Okay, yeah, it was definitely a typo. Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. Okay, so it's a typo. So let me read it again up here. It is, it, hold on. It's not Jeremiah 9 and 9. It's not the book of Jeremiah. It's Zechariah. Which I caught it because it said it was Zach, Jeremiah 9 and 9. Then it gave the scripture. Then the reference was Zechariah 9 and 9. That's why I had to check real quick. Okay, so let me read this over. What the author is actually doing is providing just enough details to make it logically clear that four asses were brought to Jesus. Lazarus and the donkey that are described in Matthew and the two cults described in Mark and Luke. The image that the author is working to create, the image that the author is working to create is a spoof of the prophecy in Zechariah 9 and 9, which, if read literally, seems to indicate that the king of the Jews wrote three asses simultaneously. Quote, See your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. End quote, and that's Zechariah 9 and 9. I'm sorry, y'all, but some things I it just really stick out, and I just got to double check. 
I'm tedious sometimes. I'm a stickler for details most of the time. To digress, it should be noted that the literary technique the author is using occurs throughout the Gospels. The Romans love to hide their meanings in plain sight, so to speak. Thus, the literal meaning of the words is often used to convey the typological linkage as in fishing for men or eat of my flesh. In this vein, the synoptic story of Jesus' triumphal entrance is a literal fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 9 and 9 and shows that the Jewish king did indeed ride on three asses. To see the typological point they make, a reader must pay close attention to every detail of the three versions of the story in the synoptics. The young ass in Matthew is said to be at Bethany, the place where Lazarus was last seen reclining and is not described as being tied, while the cults in Mark and Luke are both described as tied and never having been sat upon before. Further, Mark's cult is said to have been brought to Jesus immediately, while the one in Luke is not. Thus, the logical reading of the stories indicate that the young ass in Matthew must be Lazarus, who has been depicted as an ass in an earlier story in John. He must be the young ass described at Bethany because not only was he last described there, but he was not bound as the asses in Mark and Luke were as he has already been loosed. Note that the same word that describes the untying of the asses in Mark and Luke was used to describe the loosening of Lazarus from his burial clothes in, their pri- in, the, in the prior story in John. And as he has been set on in the earlier story in John, he cannot be either of the asses described in Mark and Luke, who had never been set on before. Moving through the typological storyline, the need that Jesus tell his disciples in the synoptics triumphal entrance story that he has for asses. Let me read that again. Moving through the typological storyline, the need that Jesus tell his disciples in the synoptics triumphal entrance story that he has for asses is actually to transport the Passover meal, the butchered ass Lazarus, to Jerusalem. And once he has his quartet of asses, he places Lazarus' body onto the team of three mules. Jesus can now fulfill the prophecy in he put Jeremiah again. This is supposed to be Zechariah. Let me go back and look here. Let me just make sure. Let me look above. This is Zechariah. I think this is a type. This is definitely a typo. Let me just make sure. Because the whole. I just want to make sure I'm reading it right. Jeremiah. If only my head were a pool of water and my eyes were a fountain of tears. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a typo because this has had, yeah, and Jeremiah is weeping all through nine. Yeah, it is. I I just wanted to double check again, okay, because he put it in here again. I'm sorry, y'all. I guess the editor was was slipping. This is Zachariah. And at once. As And once he has his quartet of asses, he places Lazarus' body onto the team of three mules. Jesus can now fulfill the prophecy in Zechariah because he has assembled three donkeys and the king of the Jews, the ass Lazarus. The triumphal entry that the Gospels actually describe is that of three mules carrying the butchered body of the king of the Jews, while he is being sat upon by the Romanized Christ, Jesus. Once this image is understood, the gospel's triumphal entrance, typological linkage to a passage in Josephus becomes visible. Jesus' triumphal entrance is linked to wars, volume 5, chapter 13, lines 567 through 568. 
a story that mirroring the Gospels follows the description of an anointing party. Josephus describes a character he names Manius, son of Lazarus, who is obviously related to the Gospels Lazarus. This character is responsible for hauling the dead bodies of the poor through the gates of Jerusalem and for paying the public stipend for the work. Between the 14th of Nisan, Passover, and the 1st of Tammuz, 75 days, he tells Titus that he has hauled 115,880 bodies of the poor through the gates, or 1,545 per day. That dude was busy. I hope he had, he had to have a team of people helping him. Thus, when Judas states two days from Passover in Mark chapter 14, verse 5, that more than 300 denarii could have been given to the poor, the author is making a hidden comical point. As 300 denarii literally translates as 3,000 asses. The money is just enough to cover the cost for more than 3,000 asses being taken through the gates into the in hold on. as 300 denarii literally translates as 3,000 asses the money is just enough to cover the cost for the more than 3,000 asses being taken through the gates in the two days prior to Passover in Josephus the gospel's transformation of the Jewish Christ into an ass was also documented by Josephus in another story. In fact, Josephus wrote his longest exposition concerning the gospel's typology entirely about its ass head imagery. This revelation is found in Against Apion, Book 2, Chapters 7, 8, and 9. And that's the name of the book if y'all want to look that up. It's called Against. Apion, A G A I N S T Apion, A P I O N, Book 2, Chapters 7, 8, and 9. The three chapters are another masterpiece of sarcasm and use a thinly veiled typological symbolism to document the Roman achievement of having placed an ass head, the Roman Christ, in the Jewish temple. In the three chapters, Josephus rails against another historian, Apion, because Josephus states that Apion had falsely claimed that the Jews placed an ass head in their temple that was discovered by Antiochus Epiphanes when he sacked Jerusalem. That whole story, Antiochus Epiphanes, is found in the first book of Maccabees, chapter 1. The whole story is there. We'll be reading it soon. In the three chapters, Josephus rails against another historian, Apion, because Josephus states that Apion had falsely claimed that the Jews placed an ass's head in their temple that was discovered by Antiochus Epiphanes when he sacked Jerusalem. Everything that Josephus claimed in his passage about Apion is true, of course. In other words, the Jews certainly did not place an ass head in their temple. In fact, all of the claims that Josephus state, states Apion made are ludicrous and were never made. Because we all know that Josephus is a huge liar, right? Clearly, we all, we all should know that by now. What Josephus is doing with the chapters is claiming that Apion was a false historian because he wrote the exact opposite of the truth. In other words, while Apion's claims are all false, they are a mirror image of the truth. It was not the Jews, but the Romans who placed an ass head in the Jews' temple. With this simple sleight of hand, Josephus is able to inform posterity of the way in which the Romans had placed a false god, the ass head, in the Jews' temple. Against Apion, book 2, quote, For Apion hath the impudence to pretend that the Jews placed an ass head in their holy place. And he affirms that this was discovered when Antiochus Epiphanes spoiled our temple and found that ass's head of that I'm sorry. And found that ass's head there made of gold and worth a great deal of money. End quote. Josephus notes correctly 
that the Jews would never place an ass head in their temple as this would violate their laws. Quote, Abion ought to have had a regard to these facts unless he had himself had either an ass's heart or a dog's impudence. Of such a dog, I mean, as they worship, for he had no other external reason for the lies he tells of us. As for us Jews, we ascribe no honor or power to asses, as do the Egyptians to crocodiles and asps, when they esteem such as are seized upon by the former or bitten by the latter to be happy persons and persons worthy of God. End quote. Josephus notes that the Romans beat their asses with stripes, like the flogging of Jesus in the Gospels. Quote, Asses are the same with us, with they, which they are with other wise men, creatures that bear the burdens that we lay upon them. But if they come to our thrashing, but if they come to our thrashing floors, and eat our corn, or do not perform what we impose upon them, we beat them with a great many stripes, because it is their business to minister to minister to us in our husbandry affairs, end quote. Josephus next states that, quote, Apion of ours was either perfectly unskilled in the composition of such fallacies, discourses, or however, when he begun <clears throat> somewhat better, he was not able to persevere in what he had undertaken since he had no manner of success in those reproaches he cast upon us. End quote. The point of this sarcasm will become clear shortly. Josephus then states that Apion became other men's prophet with his claim that the Jews kept the man in the temple to be eaten at the same time each year. This man whose body is somehow able to feed thousands is an obvious spoof of the character in the Gospels that told his followers to eat of his flesh. The prophecy that Apion is making is clear enough. I would also note that the Grecian fable Josephus refers to as being added to below is Aesop's, the ass carrying the image which describes an ass who thought he had become a god. Quote, Apion's history adds another Grecian fable in order to reproach us, in reply to which it would be enough to say that they who presume to speak about divine worship ought not to be ignorant of this plain truth, that it is a degree of less impurity to pass through temples than to forge wicked calum calumnies of its priests. Now such men as he are more zealous to justify a sacrilegious king than to write what is just and what is true about us and about our temple. For when we are desirous of gratifying Antiochus and of concealing that perfidiousness and sacrilege which he was guilty of with, with regard to our nation when he wanted money, they endeavor to disgrace us and tell lies even relating to futurities. futurities. Apion becomes other men's prophet upon this occasion and says that Antiochus found in our temple a bed and a man lying upon it with a small table before him full of dainties from the fish of the sea and the fowls of the dry land that this man was amazed at these dainties thus set before him, that he immediately adored the king upon his coming in, as hoping that he would afford him all the possible assistance, that he fell down upon his knees and stretched out to him his right hand and begged to be released, and that when the king bid him to sit down and tell him who he was and why he dwelt there, and what was the meaning of those various sorts of foods that were set before him, the man made a lamentable complaint, and with sighs and with tears in his eyes, gave him this account of the distress he was in, and said that he was a Greek, and that as he went over this province in order to get his living, he was seized upon by foreigners on a sudden, and brought to this temple, and shut up therein, and was seen by nobody, but was fattened by these curious provisions 
thus set before him and that truly at the first such unexpected advantages seemed to him matter of great seemed to him matter of great joy that after a while they brought a suspicion to him and at length astonishment what their meaning should be that at last he inquired of the servants that came to him and was by them informed that it was in order to the fulfilling of the law of the jews which they must not tell him that he was thus fed and that they did the same at a set time every year that they used to fetch a greek foreigner and fat him thus up every year and then lead him to a certain wood and kill him and sacrifice with their accustomed solemnities and taste of his entrails and take an oath upon this sacrificing a greek that they would ever be at enmity with the greeks and that then they threw the remaining parts of the miserable wretch into a certain pit guys i didn't think it was possible hold on make sure I ain't tripping one hold on one two three okay then it's Out of all of what I just read, the last half of what I just read was one sentence. It's just broken up with colons, commas, and semicolons. They're the first three sentences, which was cool sentences, they're like normal sentences. Then, when it started at uh, Apion becomes other men's prophet, all the rest of that is one long sentence. End quote. The last line is important and links to the pruning of the Messiah typology in the Gospels. Moreover, as shown below, by placing the man's body parts in a pit, this enables a character named Zabidus to steal the ass head, which he will then place in the temple at the end of the final story. Obviously, these body parts were a foreseeing of the anointing party in the Gospels described above. Y'all wonder why that was even necessary to say, Robert, Shalom, Betswabu. Because I know I lost a lot of y'all. Y'all probably went scrolling and like, blah, 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 blah. So I had to break y'all state, bring y'all back to the reading. So I had to talk about something that really was like, why would you even tell us that? Just keep going. Yeah, because y'all probably weren't paying attention at that point. The above passage is a caricature of the Roman cannibalized Christ described in Josephus. To camouflage the description until the gospel's typology was uncovered, it described the individual as a Greek, not a Jew, but this is transparent. The same time every year the man is to be eaten is, of course, a type for the human Passover lamb and the certain wood where he is killed, foresees, notice that the story is a typological prophecy of what the gospel's claim will occur, the cross of crucifixion. The law that they must not tell him is the law that will be established by Titus with the gospels and Josephus's typology. Josephus claims that Apion went on to write, quote, the man said there were but a few days to come ere he was to be slain, and implored of Antiochus that, out of reverence he bore to the Grecian gods, he would disappoint the snares the Jews laid for his blood, and would deliver him for, from the miseries which he was encompassed. Now this is such a most tragical fable, as is full of nothing but cruelty and impudence, Yet does it not excuse Antiochus of his sacrilegious attempt and those who write it 
in his vindication are willing to suppose. For he could not presume beforehand that he should meet with any such thing in coming to the temple, but must have found it unexpectedly. He was therefore still an impetuous person that was given to unlawful pleasures and had no regard to God for his actions. But as for Apion, he have done whatever his extravagant love of lying have dictated to him, as it is most easy to discover by a consideration of his writings, for the difference of our laws is known not to regard the Grecians only, but they are principally op opposite to the Egyptians and to some other nations also, for while it so falls out that men of all countries come sometimes and so join among us, how comes it about that we take an oath and conspire only against the Grecians and that by effusions of their blood also? Or how is it possible that all the Jews should get together these sacrifices and the entrails of one man should be sufficient for so many thousands to taste of them as Apion pretends? End quote. The meaning of the above passage is clear and is a comic description of the feeding of thousands miraculously accomplished by Jesus in the Gospels. It is another example of the strange lack of attention by New Testament scholars to the overt relationships between the Gospels and Josephus. As Jesus had flatly stated that his flesh was to be eaten and somehow fed to thousands, the possibility that the passage is a spoof of Jesus should be explored irrespective of the analysis in Caesar's Messiah. The next passage is witty and describes exactly what the Romans did with the Jews' Messiah. They brought him back to Rome, figuratively, where they used him to remove the demons of the Jews. The passage repeats the theme found in Antiquities, volume 8, chapter 2, verses uh, 46 through 49 say verses, pages where following the war the pruned messiah Eleazar was used to exercise the demonic hatred of the Jewish rebels quote or why did not the king carry this man whosoever he was and whatsoever was his name which is not set down in Apion's book with great pomp back into his own country when he might thereby have been esteemed a religious person himself and a mighty lover of the Greeks, and might thereby have procured himself great assistance from all men against that hatred the Jews bore to him. End quote. The next passage in the story is one of the clearest descriptions the Romans left us of the real nature of the Gospels and for whom they were intended. The hatred is palpable. Trina Hager, hey, quote, But I leave this matter, for the proper way of confuting fools is not to use bare words, but to appeal to the things themselves that make against them. I'm going to read that again. Quote, But I leave this matter, actually, let me say this. The next passage in the story is one of the clearest descriptions the Romans left us of the real nature of the Gospels and for whom they were intended. The hatred is palpable. Quote, but I leave this matter for the proper way of confuting fools is not to use bare words, but to appeal to the things themselves that make against them. End quote. This statement, of course, applies not only to the Gospels, but to the words that Josephus is writing. The bare words of against Apion and the Gospels are not their real meaning, but are simply the method by which the Romans appealed to the things that showed the fools that they were in error. Josephus' point is that the Jews believed that their God was more powerful than Caesar and looked into their scripture for divine patterns that would show them when their Messiah would come. The Gospels and the works of Josephus were thus created to confute these fools. As he did with the testimony of Flavian and the two tales that follow it, Josephus unified the three tales concerning the ass head 
in against Apion into a conceptual whole. In his final part, the three-piece set, he described a star that walks the earth, a play on the Jews' star prophecy of the Messiah that the Flavians claim foresaw themselves. This star is using a certain wooden instrument in three rows, representing the three crucifixes at Golgotha in order to keep the Jews quiet and at a distance so that he might break into the temple and steal the ass head, which was left behind in the pit by the cannibalized Jesus in the prior story. This story precisely recalls the descriptions of Jesus' followers during the crucifixion of Jesus and the two robbers. In other words, just as the fictitious Azhead story in the Gospels leads to the fictitious history of Josephus, whereby Titus replaced the Jews' God, the prior story leads to the character named Zabidus, leaving behind an Azhead in the Jewish temple. I need to point out the craftsmanship by the authors in that the three Azhead stories compress the entire gospel slash Josephus top topological histories into a tiny literary space. The passage is witty, but to understand it requires knowing that Zabbatus is actually a pun on Saba 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 Zeus. I probably pronounced that wrong. He's the original it's the original Roman name for the God for the Jews God. Thus Zabidus is also hold on. Saba Saba Zeus Zabidus. Okay, let me read this again. The S's and the Z's screw me up. The passage is witty, but to understand it requires knowing that Zabidus is actually a pun on Sab. Sabazis, the original Roman name for the Jews' God. Thus, Zabidus is also a type for Titus, who named himself the Jewish God Christ and used a certain wooden instrument, the cross. Josephus comments on the fictional aspect of the gospel's character Jesus with a comment, quote, But still it seems that while Zabbatus took his journey over the country where so many ten thousands of people, nobody met him, end quote. And then it's going to a even longer quote, y'all, so bear with me. Quote, what then can we say of Apion, but that he, exclaimed, that he examined nothing that concerned these things while he still uttered incredible words about them? But it is a great shame for a grammarian not to be able to write true history. Now, if he knew the purity of our temple, he hath entirely omitted to take notice of it. But he forges a story about the seizing of a Grecian, about ineffable food, and the most delicious preparation of dainties, and pretends that strangers could go into a place wherein the noblest men among the Jews are not allowed to enter unless they be priests. This, therefore, is the utmost degree of impiety and a voluntary lie in order to the delusion of those who will not examine into truth of matters, whereas such unspeakable mischiefs as are above related have been occasioned by such calumnies that are raised upon us. Nay, this miracle of piety derides us further, and as the following pretended facts to his former fable, for he says that this man related how, while the Jews were once in a long war with the Egemeans, there came a man out of one of the cities of the Egemeans who there had worshipped Apollo. This man's name is said to have been Zabidus, came to the Jews and promised that he would deliver Apollo, the god of Dora, into their hands, and that he would come to our temple if they would all come up with him and bring the whole multitude of Jews with them. That Zibidus made him a certain wooden instrument and put it round about him and set three rows of lamps therein and walked after such a manner that he appeared to those that stood a great way off of him to be a kind of star 
walking upon the earth that the Jews were terribly affrighted at so surprising an appearance and stood very quiet at a distance and that Zabbatus, while they continued so very quiet, went into the holy house and carried off that golden head of an ass for so for so facetiously does he write and then went his way back again to dora in great haste and say you so sir that i may reply then does apion load the ass that is himself and lays on him a burden of fooleries and lies for he writes of places that have no being and not knowing the cities he speaks of he changes their situations for Ijumir borders upon our country and is near to gaza which there is no such city as dora although there be it is true a city named dora in phoenicia near mount carmel but it is four days journey from Ijumir. now then Why does this man accuse us? Because we have not gods in common with other nations. If our fathers were so easily prevailed upon to have Apollo come to them and thought they saw him walking upon the earth and the stars with him, for certainly those who have so many festivals wherein they light lamps must yet, at this rate, never have seen a candlestick. (laughs) This is funny. But still, which I completely get it because... It's like he, what he's explaining that happened. He's like, well, first of all, y'all must not be familiar with the city and with what's going on. And you're clearly not familiar with the laws of the Jews, right? So, which is the same thing that happens when you read the New Testament, when you are ignorant of the Torah, it's like, how would you even believe that? Because first of all, their God tells them not to do this and they don't make a practice of doing these certain type of things. So how would you even get caught up? being fooled by this which we clearly were being fooled by a lot of stuff in the new testament because we were ignorant of what the torah said right because when remember i spent i spent a couple years in the torah just reading the torah alone then i went back to the new testament it's like "Er, what in the world hold up what is going on here i remember one night i I fell asleep listening to the books of the prophets right because normally at night i just put on the bible and i let it play i put it at the beginning well not necessarily beginning i started in the the books of the prophets and let that play through and that'll normally take me to the morning at least about five in the morning and i remember this particular night when it finished the old testament when it finished malachi it went right into the book of matthew right and i'll never forget i even wrote it down in my dream calendar it was about 602 that morning and what happened was as it began to play as the book of Matthew began to play, it got to chapter five. It was in chapter five. That's the chapter where uh, Jesus going through all the, um, I think it was chapter five. I remember the, the genealogy, chapter two, three. I think it's chapter five. Don't quote me, but I think it's chapter five where it talks about how the the meek shall inherit the earth and all that stuff, right? But when it had got there, the part, like if you have a red letter Bible, when Jesus actually starts speaking, when it gets to the red letter, so to speak, but I was listening to the U uh, version Bible, when Jesus started speaking, I was immediately, like my, my, it, I was jolted out of my sleep, almost like I was being choked. I I called my mama. I was like, this is crazy. It got to the New Testament and immediately, almost during, it literally choked me out of my sleep because it it brought such a disruption to my spirit. Like, it's nothing like this had ever happened to me before. And mind you, I had only been in the Torah, constantly filling myself with it day in, day out. I put the New Testament away for a minute. And I realized it was, it was at that point that I realized something had changed something was completely different and it, that was when i really began to start questioning what is the new testament really because i was still kind of you know i hadn't really start calling out jc for real i wouldn't call him out on his fooleries and paul and stuff yet i was still just kind of being broken into something is wrong here right it literally choked me out of my sleep it was like i couldn't breathe like I was like, what in the world? And I immediately knew it was what I was hearing. I'm like, what is this crap? I went to go grab my phone because it was playing on my phone, not my phone on the floor. And I went to go stop it. And I'm like, what is this? And I opened it up. Uh, well, I, I cut it back on, hit the light. And it was in Matthew chapter five. I'm like, what? And I grabbed the Bible. 
And then I opened it up and I started going through it. I was like, oh, this is complete blasphemy what he's speaking out of his mouth. I said, this is, I was like, why is he talking against, he is, that's when I realized that just about everything that came through his lips was a lie. (laughs) Because it completely goes against what the creator of the earth had said. And I was like, that. that's when I really began to be bothered about a lot of stuff that I was reading in the New Testament. I, I couldn't really quite put it together on why it was like that. Because at first I was like, maybe something's gotten a hold of me. Maybe maybe I'm the one that's wrong because clearly this is Jesus speaking. This this Jesus, I, I shouldn't be feeling this way about him. You know, and it's just this started that cycle of tearing everything apart and looking into the details and everything he said going back and see what y'all said and i'm like oh yeah no that don't go i said jesus y'all got a problem with you because that's the exact opposite of what he said you telling people to drink your blood and eat your flesh and your whore told people not to do that not even think about it he said those thoughts never crossed his mind anyway y'all we can pause right here but this 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 is exactly what he's saying when he's talking about Apion. He said he writing all these. I said clearly, first of all, he he apparently has no clue about the Jews and how they operate because anybody that knows them and the lifestyle they live know that they don't even do stuff like this. Let alone, and if he did, he completely ignores it. And he's he's everything that's coming through his lips is a lie, right? He's he's purposely he's being facetious and he's purposely lying to you all. That's what Josephus is saying about. So we'll pause right here. When we start tomorrow, I'm going to just start this whole portion again right here. We're just going to read that over and just carry that on. Because we are already at an hour and five minutes. And I would take this on a little bit longer, but I have to go do something this morning. Let me see. How many more pages we got? Oh. We literally got one page. No, I mean, I take back what I just said. I'm going to go ahead and finish this. Like, we literally, we literally have not even a full page. So, I'm going to just go ahead and read it. Because that'll be the end of chapter 13. Okay, let me just cross my mark out. Put a big X. No. No. I should have looked first. Literally got one page. I'm going to just go ahead and kill this one page, y'all. Okay, look. I'm going to start at, like, the last sentence he said. It's a long sentence, but listen. Now then, why does this man accuse us because we have not gods in common with other nations? If our fathers were so easily prevailed upon to have Apollo come to them and thought they saw him walking upon the earth and the stars with him, for certainly those who have so many festivals wherein they light lamps must yet at this rate have never seen a candlestick. But still it seems that while Zabidus took his journey, over the country where were so many ten thousands of people, nobody met him. He also, it seems, even in a time of war, found the walls of Jerusalem destitute of guards. I omit the rest. Now the doors of the holy house were seventy cubits high and twenty cubits broad. They were all plated over with gold and almost of solid gold itself. And there were no fewer than twenty men required to shut them every day, nor was it lawful ever to leave them open. Though it seem though it seems this lamp bearer of ours opened them easily or thought he opened them, as he thought he had the ass's head in his hand. End quote. Joseph then concludes his spoof on Titus's placing the ass's head in the Jews' temple by writing quote whether therefore he returned it, the ass head, to us again, or whether Apion took it and brought it into the temple again, that Antiochus might find it and afford a handle for a second fable of Apion's is uncertain. End quote. In other words, Josephus sets up the future of the ass head to appear again in the temple within a second fable, the Gospels. The Servant's Commentary. To end the dark journey of the ass head in the temple on a positive note, sometime after Christianity began to be promoted in Rome, someone, likely a servant, came to understand the symbolism concerning the pruned Christ with the ass head. 
Perhaps the servant had overheard patricians joking about how they had given the Jews an ass's head to worship. Or perhaps the owner simply told the individual truth so that so as to keep him or her from succumbing to the false religion intended for the slaves. Whatever these facts are, ain't that something? They they just gave you religion to keep you enslaved. Look, like, we need to go ahead and tell y'all truth about this so y'all don't get taken away with some of these lies. And clearly, some of them have gotten taken away with the religion that was created to keep the slaves at bay, right? Mom, shalom. Listen, perhaps the servant had overheard the patricians joking about how they had given the Jews an ass's head to worship. Or perhaps the owner simply told the individual the truth so as to keep him or her from succumbing to the false religion intended for slaves. Whatever these facts are, someone decided to record the secret they had learned. It is just a, it is just a crude scratching on a wall in the servants' quarters of the palace of the Caesars on Palatine Hill. But it is a treasure almost beyond words. It is one of the few depictions of Jesus' crucifixion ever made by someone who knew the truth. And I'm about to show y'all this picture. I hope y'all be able to see it. If you got the book, you can see it clearly. Uh, and I'll read what the bottom of it says and I'll show it to you. Under these two pictures, this inscribing. One of them is actually a picture of the wall. The darker block is a picture of the wall. And what they did beside of it where it just looked like stick lines and letters where it's really clear in the background is clear. They've actually pulled that drawing off of the wall and they removed the dark background so you can see clearly what has been inscribed into that wall. Okay. The Greek text inscribed here reads as follows. In Galilee font. Alec Alexa Mino Sidi Tikion. That's the Galilean font. Then they have it also in Unicode. Then they have the transliterated um, into uh, it's transliterated into the English alphabet. Alexa Mino Tithion. Okay, but anyway, all that translates as. Alexa Minos worship God, right? Okay, so oh, hold on, let me show it. Hold on, I'm showing it to YouTube first, Facebook all the way over here. I show it up here. Okay, so this is the actual picture of it, and they were able to remove the dark background so you can see it really clear there. For those of you that want to screenshot it, go ahead and screenshot it. I think it's clear enough. That's all of it. Grand Rising, Belinda Brown. Okay, I'm sure to. I don't think anybody over here on Facebook, everybody dropped off, but I'm going to show it anyway, just in case they come back later and look at it. Let me get all of it in the screen. Hold on. That's it. Okay. I'll hold it for a second so somebody can screenshot it if they want to. If I fall out of this chair, I'm leaning over to the side. Okay. All right. Y'all seen it? Good. Okay. All right. And that's it. That's the end of chapter 13, y'all. So that was pretty good. So tomorrow we'll pick this back up. The scope of Roman planning, rabbinical Judaism. And I think I want to say, I'm trying to double check and see if it's done with the breakdown of Revelation, if it's going to pick back up with it. Hold on. I actually think it okay i think yesterday was the end of the breakdown of revelation yeah okay yeah so chapter 14 chapter 14 is the last no i'm sorry well yeah chapter 14 is the last chapter but chapter 15 is the conclusion so yeah we'll be done with this in a few days y'all We'll be done with the whole book. Then it goes into the epilogue. We'll read all of that. And we'll go through the bibliography. And I give you all the references just in case. Just like I did with Caesar's Messiah. That's going to take a little while. But I record it. You ain't got to write them all down. But if you want to come back and listen to it again, at least you'll have all the references and resources that he used 
um, throughout this book. I mean, some that you missed earlier when it called it out, but yeah, it's like. And 11 pages of references but we're gonna read them i'm gonna read them just like i did in season messiah all right beautiful people that is it yeah but it don't seem like these books are like 400 page over it's like 450 pages y'all this one is but it doesn't seem yeah oh 450 pages that's including index at the back it doesn't seem like it's taking us that long. It seems like time time is already passing fast. But when we get to the end of the book, it's like, man, we literally just started, right? But a lot of us, sometimes we pick up a book that's like 400 pages. Yeah, right, I'm going to read that. But I'm an avid reader anyway. And I find it's easier now, especially with the Audible, right? Thank you all for technology. It can be a beautiful thing for certain things, right? Um, I'm able to consume a lot more with a listen to audible but even still it, it will what we've been here a couple months but it's still not that long if you are consistent every single day just read a, a, a few pages you will realize you will scale an entire book in a very short amount of time consistency is the key it's like my husband tell me all the time consistency is the key don't start stuff and don't finish consistency 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 i'm like you're talking to me or to the kids Girl, I'm talking to you. I'm like, what am I not consistent about? There are some things that I could work on. But I'm telling y'all, consistency is the key, right? Slow and steady runs the way. Uh, maybe not all the time. Sometimes a fast sprint will ruin the race for you, right? But if, if, if it's a long race, slow and steady is the key, right? You got to realize when to apply certain things. In a longer race... Slow and steady is the key. You got to find your pace and stick with your pace. If it's a short race, first of all, you better know it's a short race and you better blow it out. Ain't This ain't time for, for slow and steady. This is time for kick rocks. Let's go, right? Catch your breath at the end. But this, this, this is a long race, so slow and steady wins it, right? All right, y'all. So with that being said, y'all, it is Sunday, November the 28th, 2021. Day 313 of year three of reading through the books of the law and the prophets and of the three-year consecutive day count. Day 981, we read Psalms 134 through 136. And we read the rest of chapter 13 and Shakespeare's Secret Messiah, pages 375 to 388. And we are, we're going to name the video today, The Ass-Headed Christ. I know this seemed kind of harsh, but I like the title. <laughs> all right, y'all, let's do the blessing. I didn't call Bella down. I think they all still sleep. They stayed up late. And I didn't I didn't hear anybody move. Nobody jumped down off the bed, nothing. So I'm just going ahead and do this, right? All right, y'all. The blessing, remember, it is found in Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 27. Remember, the Nazarite vow is the first 21 verses of the chapter and you who spake unto moses saying speak unto aaron and unto his sons saying on this wise you shall bless the children of israel saying unto them Yahuwah will kneel before us presenting gifts and will guard us with the hedge of protection. Yahuwah will illuminate the wholeness of his being towards us, bringing order, and he will provide us with love, sustenance, and friendship. Yahuwah will lift up his wholeness of being and look upon us, and he will set in place all we need to be whole and complete. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. All right, beautiful people. That is it for today. I love y'all. Thank y'all for hanging out. And I'll see y'all back here tomorrow morning, 7.15 a.m.-ish. I'm going to stop saying ish, but I got to say ish just in case I'm running on ish time. The goal is to be here on time a few minutes early. I'm going to pull myself together, y'all, in the morning. Sometimes, you know, just be running behind. But anyway, we here. Consistency is the key. We've been here daily, except for the Sabbath. And a couple days where I couldn't be here. Right? But anyway, y'all. Back here tomorrow morning, 7.15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Mm.